Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. Today we're going to be looking at apoptosis. Now there's already a short video which is just a concept idea, but this is going to be getting into the nuts and bolts of apoptosis and the mechanisms of the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. So our objectives will be to describe the process of apoptosis and to compare and contrast these two pathways. So this is going to just be a quick overview because you can't talk really about apoptosis without also mentioning necrosis because it's important to compare and contrast. So necrosis is typically caused by severe injury, such as ischemia, infections, trauma, or toxins, and is characterized by membrane damage, protein denaturation, leakage of cellular contents, local inflammation, and enzymatic digestion of the cell. And typically you'll end up with loss of functional tissue and impaired organ function. Now, by contrast, apoptosis is something that can be seen in physiologic as well as pathologic processes and can be caused by growth factor deprivation, excess DNA or protein damage, or the accumulation of misfolded proteins. The mechanism is cell dissolution without complete loss of membrane integrity. So the analogy I like to use is comparing a tomato that is a sun-dried tomato that shrinks down and then becomes a tasty bit for a macrophage to eat. The consequences of apoptosis are a tidy removal of cells as that little bit of uh, sun-dried tomato is popped into the phagocyte's mouth. And here is that image just from that uh, quick concept video. You have a tomato here uh, that has been left on a windowsill for several weeks and it basically rots. Uh, li liquids uh, run out. Uh, fruit flies or ants come around. These are analogous to uh, neutrophils. Whereas uh, apoptosis, what we see is in a sun-dried tomato. So this one has been carefully dehydrated. It shrinks down, membranes are intact, and it becomes a tasty bit. So apoptosis is known as uh, po programmed cell death, right? So it is a careful uh, movement away from viability. So it is the regulated enzymatic destruction of DNA protein and proteins. The plasma membrane remains intact. Now the cells shrink, as in our sun-dried tomato, and the chromatin will marginate and condense, which you can see here in this electron micrograph. So you can see here, this is the nucleus, and there's this dark condensation of chromatin here at the periphery. You will get uh, cytoplasmic blebs uh, and apoptotic bodies. And I think of apoptotic bodies is like potato chips. You just pop them into your mouth or a sun-dried tomato. They send out these eat me uh, signals, uh, sort of like what you would see in Alice in Wonderland, which draw in the phagocytes to eat them up, thereby clearing away uh, the dead cell. There's minimal inflammation. Now, there are physiologic causes of apoptosis, such as uh, we see it during embryogenesis and fetal development. Uh, Hormone-dependent involution, so an example of this would be uh, during lactation, the breast will grow in size, but after weaning, the uh, cells are going to uh, then become uh, no longer necessary and will die. And you don't want these unnecessary cells to then just uh, provide necrosis and inflammation because that's really damaging to the body. So they're going to uh, involute using uh, apoptosis. We have the cell loss and proliferating cell populations. As you're aware, the uh, lining of the, uh, the mucosa of the uh, GI tract is constantly uh, proliferating. And when those cells have reached the end of their lifespan, they need to die and go away. But once more, the body needs a tidy way to do this so they don't end up with massive inflammation, which would be really disastrous for the body. Also, from uh, your immunology lectures, you'll know that you have to eliminate those self-reactive lymphocytes uh, because they can cause a lot of damage to the body, and you want them once more to just involute and die through apoptosis. And then you have cells that have served their function. So when you have a, a massive infection and neutrophils and lymphocytes come in, once they've done their job, they need to die. Uh, they need to, to go away. And you don't want your neutrophils and lymphocytes to call in more neutrophils and lymphocytes, bringing in more inflammation. So they too will undergo apoptosis. Now here's just an example uh, from a paper that I really like, which shows uh, embryo, uh, the role of apoptosis as embryogenesis. So here you can see in this mouse, uh, when the limb bud comes out, it's just a, a little ball. And as uh, the, uh, the digits uh, are formed, there's this web of tissue between here, and that web of tissue has to disappear, right? Otherwise we'd have uh, little frog feet. Uh, in hands. And so this uh, tissue here is going to disappear once more through apoptosis, right? Because you want to get rid of the cells without provoking uh, an immune response. 
And then here's an example of the GI tract where you can see uh, these proliferating cells are undergoing apoptosis, which you can recognize. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but it's condensed down. You can see fragmentation of the nucleus, uh, but you don't see any inflammatory cells around. Uh, there's uh, there's really just uh, the cells just are dying in place and they'll they'll just disappear. And this is an example uh, from uh, one of my earlier talks where this is a, a myocardial infarct. Uh, and so the process that's going on here is actually necrosis. But what the neutrophils are undergoing once they've completed their job is apoptosis. Right. So if you look around, you can see here there are these tiny little apoptotic bodies, these uh, condensed, fragmented nuclei. So this is uh, these nuclei have done their job. These neutrophils have done their job and now they are dying. OK, but you don't want them to die and bring in more inflammation. So this is uh, an image by Abhijit Das, who is our associate editor and Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology 11th edition. Uh, and this is just uh, an overview. Right? So what happens in apoptosis is you will get reduction in cell size. So they're going to shrink down like our sun-dried tomato. Uh, you're going to get that peripheral condensation of chromatin, uh, which I showed you in the electron micrograph. And all of the organelles are going to pack in more closely uh, as the cell shrinks. You'll get these little membra membrane blebs and cellular fragmentation with these what are called apoptotic bodies, these little potato chips that uh, send out little signals uh, that bring the phagocytes in and they gobble them up. Right, so and then just completely disappear. Now the next image I'm going to show you is going to look a little overwhelming, so I'm going to tell you that we're going to walk through it slowly. Okay, so this is the image uh, from the next edition of Robbins, uh, um, Robbins 11th edition, uh, that we're going to work through, and we're going to go through slowly to understand the pathways of apoptosis. All right, so let's begin first by talking about the intrinsic mitochondrial pathway. So. There are two pathways of apoptosis, the intrinsic and the extrinsic. The intrinsic pathway is also called the mitochondrial pathway because it really uh, is dependent on the mitochondrial membranes. And this is the major mechanism of apoptosis in all mammalian cells. What happens is you have increased permeability of the mitochondrial outer membrane. And when this happens, there are substances within the mitochondrion that are released. These are pro-apoptotic molecules, such as cytochrome C, which are released into the cytoplasm. And the release of these molecules is regulated by what are called the BCL2 family of proteins. Now, BCL2 uh, stands for B-cell lymphomas, and you're going to see uh, BCL2 again and again and again. Uh, and they are uh, anti-apoptotic, so keep this in mind. This is an important uh, protein uh, to know about. Now, the BCL2 family is huge. There are 20 or more members. Uh, and so we're going to just focus right here on what their general functions are. So some of these are called uh, sensors. And examples of these include BAD, BIM, and BID. And what they do is they sense cellular stress and damage. And they will regulate the balance between anti- and pro-apoptotic proteins. Now, you'll see here I have a reference here to a BH domain. So BH stands for BCL2 homologous domain. And I don't know to what um, depth uh, your particular program goes into uh, apoptosis, but I wanted to be sure you had an idea about this in case this is something that they focus on. So I'm going to talk about the BH domains here first of all. So the anti-apoptotic uh, BCL2 proteins, uh, for example, BCL2 and BCLXL, have four of these BCL2 homologous domains, or four BH domains. Our pro-apoptotic uh, BCL2 proteins are going to have three of them, and then our sensors are only going to have one. Now the BH domains are numbered uh, BH1, 2, 3, and 4, and the sensors are, the one domain they have is BH3. So these are sometimes referred to as BH3 proteins. So I just want you to know what that is in case you see it in your reading uh, or elsewhere in your courses. All right, so those are the sensors. They have one BH domain, and they're the ones that regulate the balance between these two families of proteins here. Your ones that are anti-apoptotic and your pro-apoptotic. So your classic anti-apoptotic protein is going to be BCL2. And what its job is, is to keep the outer mitochondrial membrane impermeable. By doing this, it prevents leakage of cytochrome C and other death-inducing proteins into the cytosol. The pro-apoptotic ones, the examples of this would be BAX and BAC. What they do, by contrast, is to insert into the mitochondrial membrane, forming a channel that allows cytochrome C to leak into the cytosol. 
Now these proteins are found on the outer mitochondrial membrane. They can also be found in the cytosol as well as in the endoplasmic uh, reticulum uh, membrane. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're envisioning where they are. This is really a membrane uh, process. A lot of what's going to happen is happening on the surface of that, that outer uh, mitochondrial membrane. Okay, oops, sorry. Uh, so this is an image uh, from uh, an older edition of Robbins uh, that I particularly like. Uh, and so I'm going to use this uh, as well as another one, and then we're going to get into the newest iteration. So growth factors and survival signals. So say you have a happy, viable cell, and it's getting growth factors and it says, life is good, we're living, the, we're living the dream, everything is happy. What's going to happen here is with this stimulation, you're going to get the production of your anti-apoptotic protein, so your BCL2. And BCL2 are these little... Uh, blue paramecia or little blue curved hot dogs and you can see them here on the outer membrane of the mitochondrion okay and they are abundant and they are uh, resisting uh, permeability of this membrane okay what is in uh, opposition to them are the back's back protein so here's this little light green caterpillar which is going to uh, be bound to BCL2 or BCLXL uh, which keeps it from being active so here we are, we have a nice uh, uh, membrane, which is intact. None of this little red cytochrome C is leaking out. Okay, so that's in the happy world. Now let's see what happens if things go awry. So if you don't have survival signals, so in the involuting breast, there are no longer those growth factors, uh, the cells are no longer being supported, perhaps you have a significant radiation, which is going to cause DNA damage. These are going to cause activation of our sensors, right, which we referred to before as the BH3 only proteins. And these look like uh, little uh, sort of those orange circus peanuts, I think, sort of gluey and orangey. And that's useful to think of because they stick to things, okay? And the sensors, these little sensor proteins, are going to bind to our BCL2, which you can see here. You see the little, the little orange circus peanut attached here to our little blue hot dogs, right? And they're going to activate backs and backs. So there's another little guy attached right here to our backs back, our little light green guys, who have now opened up to let cytochrome C out into the cytosol, which is going to cause all sorts of problems. Once the cytochrome C is out, we're going to go through activation of caspases and apoptosis. All right, so that is uh, just um, coning down on those issues, and now we're going to look through the whole process. Okay, we're going to reorient here. Uh, this is, uh, here are the factors that are going to drive us uh, towards apoptosis. So growth factor withdrawal, uh, absent surviving signal, uh, protein misfolding, DNA damage, etc. Okay, what happens here is then we have our BH3 sensors are activated. Here, our backs and back look like little Pac-Man. Uh, and remember, I told you that these guys could be in the cytosol. So these sensors are going to stimulate them. They're going to uh, come over here to the outer uh, membrane of the mitochondrion. And the two of them are going to form. They're going to, going to oligomerize, form a pore, and cytochrome C and other pro-apoptotic proteins are going to come out. This is going to, along with some other cofactors, uh, is going to activate caspase 9. And these are then going to start this, um, this cascade uh, of activation where you'll get downstream caspases activated, which are going to come along here, uh, activate uh, the proteins, uh, including endonucleases, uh, and a breakdown of proteins and cytoplasm. This is going to cause secretion of soluble factors by the apoptotic cell. We have our little apoptotic body here. And we have our phagocyte who is coming over and very politely just gobbling this up. So the cell has gone uh, from this situation where it says it's time to die to just folding in on itself and being consumed. All right, so that is our intrinsic pathway. Now let's talk about the extrinsic uh, pathway. So this is a pathway that's initiated by engagement of plasma membrane death receptors, okay? And most of these death receptors are members of the tumor necrosis factor or TNF receptor family. And they have a cytoplasmic death domain, uh, which causes these protein-protein interactions and begins the downstream cascade. Now, the two important death receptors that you should know are the type 1 TNF receptor or TNFR1 and FAS. And FAS is also known as CD95. And this is all going to make more sense when I show you the picture. 
Uh, so FAST ligand, FAST-L, is expressed mainly on activated T cells that recognize self-antigen and on cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So remember, this is the pathway that is primarily used to eliminate those self, uh, self-reactive T cells. All right, once more, we're going to start with uh, an older image. This is from uh, Pathologic Basis of Disease, because what I like about this is it really brings in uh, the uh, extra, um, the, the, the cell over here. So here you can imagine this is a self-reactive T cell, and it's expressing fast ligand, okay? Now, that's all I want you to appreciate from this, because we're going to cone down in greater detail here. Oops, sorry, here. <laughs> um, I brought this in, in in the image in our textbook, we don't show that it's on an external cell. It almost looks like fast ligand is just uh, hanging out there. So I wanted to uh, be sure you recognize that this is the context. It's not that fast ligand is just floating around out here in the extracellular milieu. It's actually being expressed here on these self-reactive T cells. Now what we see here uh, is our, our protein here, which this is uh, FAST. So CD95, or it could be the type 1 uh, tumor necrosis factor receptor, all right? And in normal health, it's just sitting out here. Uh, it's, um, it's not doing anything. But once it encounters this self-reactive T cell, you have these, um, this cross-linking that occurs. So once you have uh, these uh, oligomers forming, right, where they're all joined together, this is what's going to cause uh, the uh, death domain to form. So once you have this death domain uh, that forms a complex, then you're going to get the signaling through uh, some additional proteins to activate caspase 8. Now caspase 8 is then going to, once more, uh, activate downstream caspases, and we're going to move through activation of enzymes and the same processes that we saw in our other, uh, in our other pathway, in the intrinsic pathway. So this, once more, brings it all together. This is the image from uh, the, the textbook. You can see we don't have that cell there, so I want you to remember there's a cell hanging out out here. And this just shows you the mitochondrial pathway coming down here and the uh, extrinsic pathway coming along here. All right, so I wanted to take a moment because there's a really nice image that I think also uh, demonstrates what we're seeing. So the end result of this is going to be our nuclear fragmentation, uh, the breakdown of proteins in cytoplasm, and the uh, secretion of soluble factors by the apoptotic cell. So all of this is going on. But one of the really nice things that uh, I, I think is beautiful about apoptosis is that I think of you know, what happens with uh, necrosis is you have that rotten tomato and it's like you hurl it against a wall and it just splats everywhere, right? What happens instead with apoptosis is that you get very nice and neat clipping of your DNA into little packets, right? So uh, what happens is it's broken and clipped into neat little packages which can then fit into these apoptotic bodies because DNA is a really gluey, long molecule, so you need it in little packets. So this is just a beautiful illustration of me of what we're seeing, okay? So this is DNA electrophoresis. And if you uh, extract the DNA from viable cells and you put them in, in a gel and you, and you run them with electrical current, because DNA is such a large, convoluted, sticky molecule, it's just going to glop up and it's all going to stay here. If, by contrast, you extract DNA from necrotic cells, as I mentioned, it's all gone splat. So it's just being dissolved and chopped, and, and it comes out as a smear because you have these random uh, lengths of DNA. So this is just showing how it's all completely random. It's just a, a smear. By comparison, you can see here in apoptotic cells, you have this beautiful ladder. I mean, you could even use this perhaps as a sizing ladder if you, if you needed something to guess uh, how, how large a DNA fragment was. And what happens here is you get clipping between the histones. So these are going to be multiples of the distance uh, that wraps around histones. So I just think this is a really nice graphic, uh, perhaps even better than the rotten tomato and the uh, sun-dried tomato. So just some questions for you uh, to think about, to see if, what you've learned over the last um, 10, 20 minutes or so. So what are the characteristic features of apoptosis? What regulates the intrinsic pathway? And what initiates uh, the extrinsic pathway? And I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, email me at pathologycentral@gmail.com, gmail.com. And please check out my website, uh, pathologycentral.org. Uh, and please subscribe. Uh, I really appreciate it. Have a great day.